Hi, it's brilliant to be here for Topic TV once again, interviewing some of the most inspirational people across, well, internationally really, but those who have a resonance with Yorkshire. And I'm delighted to be here today with Nikki Pattinson, who is a legend, a guru in sales, retail, service of businesses. And I've been desperate to speak to her and understand more about the magic. And I'm delighted she's gonna be sharing some of it with you today. So Nikki, thanks so much for being here. Hiya, thanks for having me. <laughs> I have been desperate to talk to you and we've tried to get our diaries together because you are known global wide for the work you do. And it's just gonna be brilliant for me to listen on how you've done this phenomenal career throughout the years. It's really simple, but keep on making it sound complicated. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> you say it's simple. Is it something you think you were born with? Is, is it something that is just you and that's the way you came out? Or do you think it is an art you've developed over the years? I think it's been developed because I'm a natural watcher of the world. You know, I am this sit in a cafe and just watch how things are being bought, sold, how people are relating to each other. If you go out, and you still do what you talk about, you know that what you're talking about works. It is absolutely indisputable. So um, we've just been talking about age. I'm, I hope, a little bit older than I look. So for the... A little bit younger than I look. <laughs> so for the last 40 years, I've actually gone out and trialled every single piece of information that I talk about. Yes. So I know that it works. So t take me back to the very beginning, if you can. Mm. You started work at 16? 16, we know O levels. Right. We had O levels in those days. And it's interesting because I were always told I was stupid. I can't count. I know what's on check, Kate. I just can't add two <laughs> checks together. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I went to work in a shoe shop at £10.50 a week, Peter Lord's in Huddersfield. Now, I must have had some kind of uh, a gift because I sold more shoes in one day than anybody else could sell in a whole week. Wow. Yeah, but it was never the shoes, never the, never the money, never the selling of the shoes that, um, that got me excited. And I remember on that second day in the shoe shop, because you always have to look to see what defines you, where you actually came from, because it can give you a little clue as to where you're going. Mm. On the second day, there was a family called the Potters that used to come into the shoe shop. And Mrs. Potter came up and she got hold of me like this and she said, darling, where's your boss? I said, well, she stood over there, Mrs. Water. She said, come over here. She said, never, ever let this girl go. Wow. She's amazing. And Mrs. Waddock said, why? And she said, because my son, who was special needs, uh, my son, Andrew, will only ever let two people put his shoes on. One is me, his mother, and he's just let this girl do it. And that's why I know that she's special. Now, we have to look at why we do things because it's very rarely because of the money. Mm. And that defined me in a completely different way. And you know what? Even now, I'm not too big to tell you that I went round the back of the, of, the, of the shelving and cried my bloody eyes out because that is where all this began. It was the need for validation and definition from selling. So I would have done anything to get more of that. It were never the money and it isn't now. Was it that you were spectacularly good or was it that actually the rest of the people in that shop probably couldn't be bothered, probably took it for granted? Was there a bit of that in it as well, do you think? Um, well, I, I don't think I'd like to say that they weren't particularly good. I think they probably did it in a particular way right. that didn't work. Mm. And even all those years ago, I would, I would have been watching that and seeing why they were getting ignored, why they weren't creating a very quick, instant relationship with the people that came in and sat down. So I think that I was learning as much from them and what... Okay, everyone ready? And action. That sounds like quite an old head on young shoulders though. I mean, to be aware of others at that age, you're probably into bands and you're second day on a job, you know, is that not just you being very iconic and different, do you think? No, I think, uh, I think a lot of us think in dimension, don't we? Right. So when I'm watching something go on, when I'm watching a relationship develop, 
um, which is what we do when we people watch. You know, it's not just one thing that is going to make people go, sorry, excuse me, I'm going to speak to this person. There's a lot of dimension around it. And I think the difference between somebody who interacts in the ordinary and people who are instantly, right, I want to be in your presence, it's the ones who think about every detail, the body language, the tone of the voice, the way they send an email. Mm. There's a lot of dimension that makes it all look that, you know, if I describe it to you, you probably think it was it was quite complicated. It's not, it's very simple. It's just that every single one of those dimensions have got to bypass all logic and go straight into the consciousness. The human to human. And mm. that's obviously a massive part of the success. So we've, we've got lost your, that. We've, we've lost that. We have lost that. I've got, I've got you at 16 though, 16 yeah. in tears behind the shelving yeah. because you've had this amazing yeah. compliment. Yeah. You're going to be the best salesperson by far this store's had. They're going to be desperate not to lose you, but mm. one day they must have. So what happened? Um, <laughs> at 19, for some crazy reason, I decided to go back and do my O levels because I didn't get any, or I thought I hadn't got any. And I actually went back and did O, o level art and O level English. When I actually checked, they were the only ones that I had got. Oh so God. I went back to college and did, <laughs> and did that. But when I came out of um, a college, uh, out of college, I mean, education one for me, you yeah. know, a little bit OCD. I couldn't sit there and listen to that. So I went into, I, I, I started to get. Um, what, what I started to get sales jobs, commission only sales jobs. And I think a lot of us might have come from that background. So we're out selling life insurance. I can't count, I knew nothing about it, but I could get people to listen to me. And again, all the time I was picking it up, whether it was how to knock on people's doors and get them to let you in, which was all about the body language and the tone or how to tell a good story. I started to sell a lot of life insurance. And, um, you know, from there, I would have gone on to another, uh, another sales job that were commission only, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. But you always end up where you're meant to be, and there's no such thing as a chance meeting. And at 28, I met the man who would soon become my lovely ex-husband. Right. And, um, and thank God. How many God. people describe him that way? <laughs> <laughs> but most people have got a couple. Uh, and thank God for that. And you know what? Um, if I never did another job again, Kate, if I never worked again, what me and John created, it was worth being put on this earth for. We bought a market stall in Uddersfield called Hatley, Take the Biscuit. And we created something that was so profound, an experience that was so profound and connected with the customers that we took that business from a grand a week to just shy of two million a year, 26 years ago. Two million on a market stall in Huddersfield. This is something I need to hear. How? Please furnish me with the details. What did you do? Well, it was, you're never selling what you appear to be selling. Right. We were 10% more expensive than anybody else selling the same stock in any market that we operated in. We actually had five market stalls. Um, so most people thought they were selling biscuits. You can buy biscuits anywhere. Mm. I want selling cakes and biscuits. We'll look to see what is happening socially. And in those days, you know, Loverator, it were Maggie Thatcher's years. Mm. And what did society tell my audience in those days. They told them that if they were single parents or low-income families, then really it'd have been better if they weren't there because they were just a burden on society. They didn't actually have a value. So I sold my audience, which were 50 deep everywhere we worked, Monday to Friday, you couldn't move for people. We created a way of being, body language, words, stories, individualizing people that took those people to feelings the two feelings that they probably didn't have mm. belonging and validation because a lot of those girls the single parents they didn't actually belong to anything the world the world were very different then mm. and they certainly didn't think that they had a value because right. subliminally they were getting told that all the time so were we selling cakes and biscuits no we weren't we were selling validation and belonging to maggie thatcher's britain
And did you and your partner discuss that? Was that a tactic? Did you know it was happening or did, was it born out of the situation? No, John did all the buying right. and he was very good at that and I did all the selling. Right. So I behaved in a particular way, but I would modify it for reaction and log. Mm. So then I started to write down if you said that, if you did that, if you stood like this with the girls you were working with and went like that with your arms subliminally going, hey, you belong to us, mm. blooming egg, what a gorgeous baby bringing me here. Mm. And I started to log reaction. Right. And it was incredible how emotional those people became. They, di they actually didn't care about waiting in the queue. They wanted to wait in the queue because they wanted to see the theatre and they wanted to be taken to those feelings. So then it became indisputable and I started to teach the people that we worked with how to do exactly the same thing. And we, as I said, we were 10% more expensive than anybody else in any market that we worked in selling exactly the same stock. They were all stood with their arms folded and we were rocking out of the freaking doors. And you were making people feel special Absolutely. and validated. Yeah. And I guess remembering things about them week to next. So you'd ask how the baby's appointment had gone at the doctor's or that kind of, that kind of technique that we know. But living it, doing it day in, day out is exhausting. Oh, no. No. What a joy. It's what we put here for. Give me the bags of money we were making. Meant nothing to me. It was making those people feel better. Mm. And if you can use the words and the phraseology and the body language to make people feel better, you will never be poor. And it was that that was the joy. Brass don't make you happy. All you are is an unhappy bird in a Gucci dress and Prada shoes if you don't have a purpose in life. And that were my purpose. And you knew that then? Oh, without a doubt, yeah, absolutely. So how did you know you would then put that on a bigger platform? Because whilst you were doing great things for those people who are your customers mm. and feeling, I imagine, pretty good at the end of each day because you were living the dream, you needed to be on a bigger platform to, to spread this. So how did you get there? Ah, well, I don't think you, I don't think you often put yourself there. No. So, um, right, I call it my period of demise. So November the 2nd, 1989. Uh, I received a phone call that completely changed my world. I knew that life could never be the same after I'd taken that phone call. And you know what, Kate? We are all in that position because you never know what you're going to read on your email, what text you're going to get, what's going to come in on that phone. So you have a good time every single day because you never know. Um, my first little boy, Jackson, really funny because... Every time I looked into his eyes, I felt uncomfortable. Right from him being born, I knew they were trying to tell me something that I didn't want to hear. Uh, and that particular day, it was a hot day. It was a Thursday morning. Even though it was November, it was hot. And I took him to nursery. And as I was leaving him, I had a voice in my head saying, don't leave him. And I turned and looked at him and his eyes were just fixated on me. He was four months and two days old and he was fixated on me. Um, but I just thought, oh, all mums have that and John will kill me if I don't go to work and I carried on walking. 30 minutes to one, I took a phone call, like I said, that changed everything and they put him upstairs in a hot day in a winter suit, in a travel cot, two floors up and left him to scream and he overheated and died, which, you know, yeah, I, it's... I, the best way that I can describe it, and most people gasp when I say that and think, why is she telling us? Well, I'm sorry, but that's what made me. Mm. You know, I can walk onto any shop floor, any call center, and you just kind of get it because you know what it feels like to have your soul shattered. Mm. And, I, and you see, I, and you know, don't think I'm one of these, you know, I'm not purple pam in my ethereal tie-dye dress with, with, you know, my hair in dreadlocks. I'm really not. <laughs> I've made millions for people. But the whole thing that we talk about, Kate, is we don't talk from here. Mm. And particularly now, we speak from here. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I learned how to do that yeah. because I understood what it actually felt like to lose that soul connection. Well, you never lose a soul connection, but I actually knew what it was like to have an intense soul connection. That is just an incredible story to to come back from seeing you knowing mm. you watching and hearing of your success despite that challenge i mean there is this theory this cradles of eminence that some mm. of the greatest and the best have had that tragedy in some way in their life and and you're marking that now as a, a point of 
have changed for you? Completely. It's not in spite of, it's because of. Yes. You know, and somewhere in this interconnected universe, we all decided we were going to do that. You mm. know, that we were going to go down this path, that without that, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. Shortly after that, um, I have my second boy, Danny, who is 27 now, six foot three, and I have to tell you girls, he's quite gorgeous, although I say it <laughs> myself. Um, and my mum went into hospital uh, to have a routine heart operation, didn't come out from the anaesthetic. Quite m much more difficult to cope when you've lost somebody that you didn't have a great relationship with, to yes. be honest. Yes. Shortly after that, my dad got terminal cancer um, and, uh, and we lost him as well. Now, there's a little bit of a twist to this story because while all this was going on, my lovely husband, I thought he played squash for Yorkshire. And I've got to be a bit careful what I say here. Um, but he wasn't doing that at all. He had um, an alternative business in Bradford. Right. That involved ladies. Not squash. Not squash. Oh, no. right. OK. And, um, and unbeknown to me, uh, it got me into a quarter of a million quids worth of debt. So my father had quite a big estate and of course who were the creditors going to come at when my dad go, went but the creditors came at me and, um, and we lost just about everything, me and my little five-year-old boy, the making of me because without all that again, you know, I would probably never have needed to work again. You know, who would have wanted that kind of a life? Again, it gave me a little bit of an insight into the lives that people have. And I got myself back up from there, you know, and I'm not just talking financially because, you know, we're going to shelve that for the moment. But if I hadn't learned that, I won't be able to do what I'm doing now. So, you know, I thank God for my ex-husband. Devils are quite often angels in disguise. And he absolutely was, because without all that, there wouldn't be all this and... I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have this incredible, amazing life. Opportunities are coming now that only come along once in many lifetimes. They wouldn't have happened. I'm still flawed though. You know, I'm a mum and I'm a partner and I understand the vulnerability. No matter what anyone says, we've all vulnerabilities. We've all got a real person underneath the business facade. And you, you're there with, you've lost your mum, you've lost your dad. You've lost your financial support. You've lost your son. And... The home. Your home. You are now one of these young ladies that you were almost giving the support to yeah. from the market stall. Absolutely. How on earth do you get up the next day? How, how do you do that? Uh, after a lot of crying in the night. And there'll be a lot of people that will relate to what I'm saying. So uh, two years after being absolutely nuts... Um, which I don't think anybody could blame me for doing a like some mentalist fun. Kate Bush with a stray dog called Walt, Walter, uh, walking 16, 17 miles a day on the, on the tops of the... What do you do? How do yeah, you what do you do? It? That's, yeah, that's it. Uh, and again, you know, good or bad, your life can change in a second and a chance meeting changed everything for me. So I, um, I got a job selling design, which I knew nothing about, for what was then a very little company called Propaganda, they're now this huge, amazing design agency. Um, well, the generators of brands like GHD. Like GHD, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, they weren't quite there when I first went to work for them. But you know what, I'll I tell you what it taught me, and I, I, I quite often think about it when I'm working with single parents and, and young women. So you cry all night because mm. you don't know how the hell you're going to pay a gas bill. No. The grief, yes. the betrayal, the, you know, just the... The bereftness of The me. bereftness of my yeah. life. You know, me, me father were a farmer. He got acres and, you know, we lost everything. Um, and it were... I, I can't... I, I will never be able to find the words to explain those tears in the night. The up, down, up, down. He didn't sleep. But then, as a lot of people watching this will know, if you're a single parent, or even if you're not a single parent, you've then got to get up and you've got to get the Tommy Tippy thing out yeah. and start playing trains. Yeah. And you've got to do all that, start trying to get the middle of the night person out of the oh, way yeah. because somebody else has got to come. Yeah. And, then, and then you've got to drop somebody off that you really love and you know you don't particularly want to leave that child. And you know, for me, <sighs> I was terrified at leaving Danny. Yeah. And then you've got to go dance like a dolly for somebody for eight hours yeah. and come up with it. And then you've got to go home and do it all over again. 
Oh my God, did I learn? And I'll tell you exactly how I did it. So in the middle of the night, in those very dark times, I'd get a pot of Earl Grey with lemon, which is what I drink all the time. And I'd just write down everything that were wrong with my life, the grief, the anger, you know, we were poverty stricken, the fact that we got no money, the fact that I felt lost, wasted, all the people I were angry with. And then I'd tear it into loads of little pieces and set fire to it and just somehow, I mean, and this sounds crazy, but it worked for me. Somehow, when I saw that smoke going up, my angst went away in the ether. And then I'd write in a little notebook what I really wanted in life. And I can guarantee you that list came true. So we've heard this from a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of people watching will have seen the business gurus, the specialists, the Anthony Robbins and things. They talk a lot about this vision almost of what you want is, is that what it was it yeah was, yeah i'm imagining at this point though it wasn't full of get me the bentley get me this i'm imagining it was much more down to earth and realistic i wanted twenty five thousand pounds a year i wanted a bmw with a personal number plate right. and i wanted to fly to work right and this is exactly what happened um so i um my first day at propaganda they said right darling there's a diary there's a phone, use the phone to fill the diary. We'll see you at five o'clock. And that very first day, I got four brand new meetings from cold. Just modifying what I'd learnt on the markets and reapplying it to cold calling. Six weeks to the day, my life changed again. One of those meetings, and it was the old Lancashire Dairies in Manchester, turned into a two hundred and twenty thousand pounds piece of business and you know what i could still get emotional when i see we had faxes in them days when i see julian kiniston who was the chairman of the company throwing me this fax down the stairs into my cellar office i wonder why everybody always puts me in cellar and when i picked <laughs> it up i read it and i knew everything had changed for the boys and girls in the design room mm. everything had changed for julian who owned the business because this was a significant piece of work, mm. but most of all, everything had changed for Nikki. We did £27,000 short of a million in one year. That year, me and Julian, just taking what I'd learned on the markets, modifying it and reapplying it to other business, uh, to, to, to down, the, uh, down the line, getting appointments down the phone and then sitting and creating a presence in front of people. And you know what? How we did it still holds good, works time after time. I then went to a global agency called The Attic, and, uh, and this is where we're going to go back to that little piece of paper. So me and Danny were living in this tiny little two up, one down, Danny, my boy, in this two up, one down rented cottage. And, um, and one day, you know, I, I, I knew that I had to go out and buy me and Danny a house. And uh, as we were moving from one place to the other, this little sheet of paper fell out of a book. And Danny picked, the, picked it up and he goes, Mum, he says, that's you. He said, that's you and your life now. And it was absolutely true. They started me on £25,000 a year. I should have had a Mazda as a company car. And on the first day I got there, they said, look, really sorry. We've sold Mazda, but we've got your BMW. It's black. It's got a personalised number plate, A5TTK. And um, within six weeks, it was when they did penny flights. And I thought, well, I'll tell you what, we're not going to lose anything. I'll ring, you know, I'll ring Diageo up in Dublin and see if I can get a meeting with them. I'll book a flight and I'll write down that it's going to happen on that day. There were only one penny flight that I ever booked that we didn't have a trip out on. We did Diesel in Italy, um, Swarovski in Switzerland. Oh, just modifying what I'd learned, the way that I phrased things and told a story on the markets putting it down that phone, backing it up with emails or letters. Six weeks to the day later, we were sat in somebody's reception. You're making it sound very humble. You know this, I learned on the markets. But really, by this point, you're a killer salesperson for an ad agency. I knew what I were doing. Yes, yes. Watch my eyes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So how much then... Because part of your expertise, part of what you do is teaching mm. others to be able to share in that magic. Mm. But how much of it is this person, this Nikki, this person who can 
come from such tragedy to triumph, this person who can pick herself up by herself without the support network and go out and do that, how much of it is you, this character that's All repeatable? Of, what, well, uh, what, what, what motivates me to do it? Mm. The validation. Mm. I'm still on markets. Right. I'm still that 16-year-old girl selling shoes going, that were great, darling. You know, if I if I loved money, I'd have a load. Yeah. You know, I've yeah. made a fortune, but as I always say, unfortunately, I've spent two or three fortunes. <laughs> but it's the validation, and you always have to look to see what drives you, and it's it's the validation. And I don't think that'll ever change. But you know, I get out of bed and love what I do every single day. I hardly ever take a day off. I'm either skyping, speaking to somebody, emailing somebody out, doing something. So is that a negative thing? Or is it a positive thing? Mm. The need to be validated and a, a little piece of vulnerability. You know, we've kind of been told by society that we should be all rough and, nah, vulnerability every single time. That's mm. a massive strength and the need for validation. Much, much better than chasing brass. Now, in a couple of weeks, on a website called NikkiPattinson.com, people are going to be able to connect with you almost directly, maybe directly, and be able to say, look, this is my business. I need help. I think one of the most common things I hear in business is we're struggling with selling. Yeah. Whereas you and I, I know, have a, a shared belief that it's a joy to sell or yeah. to serve, indeed. Yeah. Um, what would they get if they were lucky enough to get you in their business? The formula to meet more people, because it's not a selling problem. It's an actually, we're professional people meters. And if you can get people to meet you and notice you and respond to you, and you can create a, a presence that makes people feel better and go to a range of feeling, feelings that makes them crack the plastic, you're never gonna be poor. So that's exactly what I do. If I go into a business, I never take any notice of what anybody says to me, and I'm sure you don't, because people have got um, sometimes a one-dimensional view of what is going on in their business. So if it's retail, I'll, you know, go and do a bit of secret shopping. If it's a call centre, I do a lot of work with call centres, I'll sit there listening in to everybody's calls, you know, looking even the way that the body moves while they're on the phone. And then I'll, I'll watch what the reaction is. Sometimes it's nothing. You know, half the retailers, I'm not being funny, if you go into some of these retailers in Leeds, if you watch what is actually going on and the relation, you know, the, the relationship, there isn't a relationship being formed mm -hmm. and there's actually no connection. No. There's no response. So I'll watch that and then I write up exactly why there's no response and I will measure the words and look at the words that are being said. It's only like, you know what, what we do, it's only like poetry. Mm. It's only like creating a picture. That's all it is. It's, it's probably more art than any other kind of art that you'd ever find anywhere. Mm. Be art changes the way that people feel. One, about their own world, but also the world of the person that wrote it or painted it. What we do is exactly the same. So I would look at it like a little piece of art. Why do I, how do I feel in this company's presence? And then I'd start to take it to pieces and put it all back together again. You are known for being straight talking, if I dare say, sometimes on, on the yeah. bluer side of life. Yeah, yeah. Do, generally, do companies appreciate that? After all the jargon, the PowerPoint, the 700 dossier that's in the cupboard collecting dust, do you think they appreciate that straight talking? I'll be really honest, I don't care if they don't. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not being arrogant. No. But I, I'm usually made, how can I phrase this, when I sit in those boardrooms, um, I'm usually made to look like little Bo Peep when people are being real. And the thing is that I don't swear for swearing's sake. No. It's sometimes you are so enthusiastic about something and you want it so much that no other word will suffice. And at the other, you know, at the other side, sometimes people are so angry and so frustrated well, what's the obvious word that's going to come out with? They're not going to go, oh, golly. So long as you don't swear at the customers, you know, and it's a bonding thing. Mm. You know, the, those words are bonding. When I used to work for the Attic and, um, and Propaganda, in fact, all the design agencies that I worked for, it was a massive tell. So, you know, crikey, I saw Nike, Swarovski, you name it. You, we posh cars, Rolls Royce. You name it, we sat with those people and it was fascinating because if they swore, 
you knew they wanted you to follow them. They were trying to bond with you. Sometimes swear words are very bonding because you usually only swear in front of the people that you've got a very special connection with. Mm. If I dropped a little word in and then they said it, I knew they were coming. A massive tell. And I hope that nobody is, um, what's the word? When, you're not, when you don't like what, when people are saying something. Offended. Offended. I hope that nobody's offended by the way that I am. Um, and if I, come, if I go back to where those words came from, when it all kicked off for me, those two, three years of my demise, the doctor turned up every day for 10 days saying, do you want some tranquilizers?" And I said, no, swearing will purge me soul. <laughs> it did then, it still does. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this movement from person-to-person -person contact, the old-fashioned tradition of retail and service, into this online phenomena. You're working with companies now that perhaps have taken a different set of rules to it because it feels different, but you're the continuity, you're the voice, you're the person who's still saying those market stall theories apply. How are you using that in today's world? You see, I don't think that everybody does want to buy online. I don't want to buy online. Mm. If it don't fit, I've got to go to the post office, take it all back, wait for somebody to come in. I think that people assume that. But if we look at, for me, what is actually going on. So you get these fancy schmancy copywriters that write fancy websites, put a bit of music on, have people, these birds, these thin birds, walking up and down catwalk, takes us to a range of dramatic feelings. We should be able to do that when people are in our presence and we've forgotten how to, and that's why it don't work. And that's why people don't go into shops because there's no theater, there's no connection anymore. You all right there, can I help you? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Not only do we delete the person saying those, what I call trans words, uh, d not only do we delete the words that we hear, you all right there, can I help you? I'm fine, thanks. Oh, all right, you all right, can I help you? No, I'm fine, thanks. Not only we delete the words, but we delete the person saying them. And that's what we need to get right. So this is a question I've been dying to ask you, and this is a very personal one, oh. so everyone can just disappear, but yeah. I have this, fuel that actually online wouldn't have been as successful, particularly in the UK, if the art of retail had have been as good as it used to be. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And if we did what we should do, could do, be who we could be in retail again, then watch it all go back. We have increased, and I mean seriously, there's some footage and you'll laugh because yeah i always put don't i look great in that baker's art in tesco absolutely i put the uniform on and i get on the shop floor you know i, I love it I, I do that every single day if i possibly could we did a 40 minute piece and in out testers about cross buns on shop floor day before good friday and we were 813 percent up fact in 40 minutes against a 12 hour trade pe trading period. Now, that is fact, that's what happens. But you see, the problem is actually bigger than we'd think. So both you and I work with a lot of young people and maybe return us to work. He's run off with secretary. She's having to go out and earn a few quid uh, generalizing there, but you know where I'm coming from. And people are terrified on that shop floor, but somebody says it's a right good idea to just walk up to everybody and say, you're right there, can I help you? So they do it 10 times and it, all they're met with is, no thanks, I'm all right. So what happens to that 17 year old mm. after that's happened 10 times, mm. they start to shrink. Mm. And it's a 17 year old that is now from a world of not being born into communication. You and I would have mm. had to have a house phone that you were picked up, yeah. told to pick up and answer yeah. properly with the phone number and your posh RP voice. Yeah. And you'd have direct conversations. That was the only way of talking. Yeah. But now everything's technology first. So they don't even have the confidence of general chat with mm -hmm. each other in their comfort zone. And like you said, that very said 17 year old on a shop floor with some patter that's going to get rejection. Absolutely. And maybe even getting a little bit aggressive because they don't know what else to do. Mm. And it actually starts even before that because I don't know too many houses where both mum and dad don't have to work now. And mm. maybe it's just mum. So they don't even get the social schooling at home. They mm. don't have the family sat around the table because nobody's got time to do mm. it. The Sunday dinner's not there. The converse isn't there. It's hard. It's difficult. And we've got to 
love that better rather than yeah, treat it mechanically. Yeah, rather than reject it. The other thing, of course, while ever you're Facebooking, tweeting, texting, you've got time to create a persona in your head. You've got time to look at the words. If you don't like them, you delete them. When you're on that shop floor or on that phone or with people, it's spontaneous. Once you've said it, you can't reel it back. It's not so deletable. It's mm. Massive pressure mm. on those people. But get it right, it's like a freaking magic stick. Which you did with your hot cross buns. So tell me what happened. Oh, you must watch the film. Um, well, if you watch that film. Where can we find the film? Tell us it's where It's on nickypattinson.com. And it's a little Tesco story. Uh, and we called that whole project the bun baking genius of Pete and other stories. And Pete with the, the baker. Um, so let's just set this scenario. When you walk into Tesco or any other supermarket and you see all those piles of hot cross buns all in plastic packaging, your subconscious says nobody actually made them. They actually came from a shoot, uh, down a shoot from heaven, <laughs> straight into plastic packaging and there's been no great emotion or pride or personality put into them. Not true. Our Pete were there at four o'clock every morning. Also, I deal with on the premise that we're actually pack animals. So if you watch me working on a shop floor, I do a lot, use a lot of body language that, and we've just done it, you belong to us, you belong to us. Because in the core of us, we're pack animals and nobody at the moment feels like we belong to anything. So again, you know, I won't go into all the dimensions, but there's a lot of dimension in selling them up cross buns. But there's a little tiny story every time I open my mouth and you'll be sick of hearing me say it because all I'm doing, I'm going, I've literally got the tray here and I'm going, Hiya, come and try some of our hot cross buns. Pete made them this morning, I'm just giving them all away. So they come over, what I've just said is Pete is real. I've got the body language thing going on here. So what I'm doing is, you belong to us. Me and Pete are really great friends. You can be our friend. And then I just go on, a story can be one or two lines. You know what, to one for now, one for freezer, two for one pound 50, toast them, bit of butter, bit of jam every night for your supper, one pound 50, last you two weeks. Now, I mean, and, and slight variations on that, but I've just put a real visual in mm. your head there. Mm. And you're actually sat, sit, watch it telly, toast a couple of hot cross buns, sit, watch it telly, Pete's made them this morning, bit of lemon curd, last you two weeks. Keep them in freezer. Honestly, people just go, we can see on film, it's mm. indisputable, people just going like that. So when I'm working, whether it's, I don't care what I'm selling, electricity, whatever, it's all in the story. Because if we just go, hey, would you like to try something? No, thanks. Would you like to try something? Would you like, happy East World chat? No. We don't, we, we actually bypass the consciousness. So it's only like making a little story that is backed up by body language and words that bypass or logic and go straight to the reason why you're going to one buy that product and two buy it from me and my mate. Nikkei, honestly, I could sit and talk to you all day and I hope the people that watching this... That don't cost a right lot extra, we're gonna say, actually. We're gonna say. <laughs> people watching this don't realise the masterclass they've just had on this video. Um, how, I don't get off on it, don't you? It's my life. It's brilliant. How, how possible, how realistic, because what I imagine a lot of people watching this are thinking is, hey, I need that person, but I'm not sure I can afford her. And also, I'm nervous, you know, what's my first steps? How, how you, you're in America, you're all over, you're international, you work with major brands. How realistic is some, someone watching this could reach out to you and engage you for their business? Drop me an email. It's, it's as simple. simple as that. You you're know, real, you're there, you'll go. You don't always want to be working. You don't, you, if you only work in one kind of company, you're not going to learn hotels. And as you know, this isn't about us just teaching other people. Uh, stuff on these projects because we learn on every single one as well and then we modify it and we roll it out to, ne to the next one so I do still work with one man bands you sit around my kitchen table and we just hammer it all out and put the words and the form the body language and the tone we put it all together get the story I still do that and if I didn't do, if I didn't like it I wouldn't do it but I love it it's you know we all have our ministry in life and this is mine. Am I ever just going to go into Tesco's or Alfred's? Uh, I'm a heck. Oh, you know, you'd still be sick of that, wouldn't you? In well, a fortnight. It, like you said, you're learning all the time. And yeah. micro businesses can teach us as much as a large business. It's been a joy. 
I'm absolutely delighted we've spent some time together. Is it over already? It is. I can't believe that. (laughs) (laughs) You are a legend at what you do, and I only hope this inspires some people to actually give the customer a better service. So thanks Uh, so much. Thank you. Well, great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I've just loved it. Thank Thank you.